Davis. I'm an attorney and executive VP at Maranatha Baptist University. Uh, I'm admitted to practice law in Illinois where I grew up. How many of you are from Illinois? I know we have a few. Good. All right. God's country. Uh, I then moved to Florida after law school, graduated from Maranatha with a business degree and then went on to law school and uh, went down to Florida to work with Dr. David Gibbs at the Christian Law Association. How many of you ever heard of CLA? All right, pray for them right now. Uh, my friends in Florida are getting somewhat battered by a hurricane, can remember those days. Uh, and you know, thankfully, since I've moved back to Wisconsin, no hurricanes, all right? You know, we have some, some blizzards every once in a while, and so it's a little bit of a trade-off, but uh, uh, the hurricanes don't generally come that far north, so it's a good blessing there. And uh, so uh, took the bar in Illinois, took the bar in Florida, passed there, got got that one picked up, and then moved to Wisconsin in 2007 with my family uh, in February. We moved to Wisconsin in February from Florida, all right? Let me tell you, I was questioning God's will for my life, all right? <laughs> Say, Lord. And we actually moved up there on the way up. Uh, it was the biggest blizzard of the year, all right? And we, we packed the truck in Clearwater, Florida in shorts and t-shirts. We got to about Bloomington Normal and the roads were so impassable, we had to pull off and take an extra day, even just to get into the state. And I thought, is this how it is all the time? <laughs> and of course, since then I've realized that, yes, that's exactly how it is all the time, even in the summer, no. Uh, and so, uh, we uh, established uh, the Davis Law Firm and a, a foundation that I help operate called Eternal Vision, which some of you may be familiar with as we help Christian schools with uh, endowments and, and with stewardship services as well. And so uh, just do those things on the side, you know, as we uh, have opportunity. So uh, what I want to talk to you about in this session is social media and the law. Now, this is an area that really didn't exist when I started in legal practice in uh, the late 90s. Uh, you barely had an email address in the late 90s. Many of the schools didn't have a website. If they did, it was not something they knew about. <laughs> some, some sophomore had uh, figured out how to claim the domain name and had set something up and the pastor may have been vaguely familiar with the fact that they had a website or what was on it. And since then things have changed just a little bit. Have you noticed that? I can remember the first few calls that I got in the arena of social media uh, had to do with what a terrible thing this was. There was a thing called MySpace. How many of you remember uh, MySpace? Of course, since then, there are a few more than just MySpace. Uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of social media sites out there. And, and MySpace, which was kind of the original, has sort of gone the way of the dinosaur. Nobody's got a MySpace anymore. It might still exist, but uh, nobody's on there. Of course, everything has shifted over to some other platform. But the original complaint was how terrible this was and how what an awful thing uh, this social media thing was and how can we ban it? That was the original question. How do we ban the kids from getting involved with stuff on the internet? And you know, as we have come a little farther with that, we realize that you know, the answer is good luck. <laughs> right? I mean, good luck trying to keep them off uh, because it's no longer something you go home Remember when you had to dial into the internet, right? And that made that awful sound, kadong, kadong, you know? There were people, uh, our IT guy in the office could actually replicate that so well with his mouth, he could trick the modem into negotiating a session, you know? <laughs> and, what are you telling that computer? And, and uh, it would think it was connected. So those, those sounds are uh, in our minds. Our kids know nothing of that. They don't know a world where you weren't online, right? Because now it's in your pocket. You know, at the college, we have internet access on campus, and this last year, we quadrupled the bandwidth from 25 megabytes per second to 100 megabytes per second. 
and by the second week of class, we were already pegging it at a complete high end. The gauges were completely broken and off the dial. And now we've had to 10 times that amount. We're installing this week. I can't wait to get back. We're installing gigabyte per second internet speeds for the campus. And then I found out there's such a thing as terabyte per second. And now I feel like, man, I really need to have that now, you know? And the problem is there is this insatiable appetite for everything new, something's happening, I have to know, I'm always connected. And, I'm, and the idea of social has moved from you and I having eye contact and a conversation <laughs> to things that we say rudely to each other online. And have you noticed how that has moved and shifted over time? And so I'm gonna talk with you today about three biggies in regards to social media and the law. What, what I'm gonna talk about is copyright because we get into some major copyright issues and that's pretty relevant for you as teachers, as educators. We're gonna talk about defamation, which is basically character assassinations that take place online and how those lines can be crossed because people don't realize there is no exception when it comes to defamation law for it was online so it's okay. That's not a defense. <laughs> and so our young people need to understand this, you need to understand this and where the lines are. And then we're gonna talk about the employment realm. And with the employment and the enrollment realm, we're gonna talk about where are the lines in terms of discipline that can or cannot be done, because you're going to find out things. What I began to realize as I heard from administrators every week and we talked about these issues, is that the social media was not creating the problem of the young people having a negative character or of doing or saying things that were inappropriate. The internet didn't create that issue. If anything, social media simply exposed what was already there. And when they came to the Christian school, and I graduated from Christian school, went all the way through from kindergarten to my uh, senior year and then off to Christian college, and if there's anything that we are very good at in Christian education is teaching young people how to act like good Christians. But the problem is, that was never the mission. That was never supposed to be the mission, right? The, the key would be, the real mission ought to be to help young people to be good Christians, right? So I knew what I was supposed to do and what I was not supposed to do. And so I was a smart guy and I was smart enough that when someone was watching or when I was at school, I would do what I was supposed to do. The question is, your character is what you do when no one's watching, right? Or when you think that no one is watching. And so what we have found is that while social media oftentimes does show us an uglier side, perhaps, of ourselves <laughs> or of our students or of employees within the ministry or otherwise, it's not necessarily creating that ugly side, but it is revealing. And so we began to look at social media a little differently, that perhaps this is actually dare I say, a helpful tool to know what's really going on. Uh, I'm friends with a lot of students at Maranatha on Facebook. You know, that's how you say you're, you're friends. You know, <laughs> we're officially friends when we're friends on Facebook. And it's very interesting to me because I learn a whole lot more about the job we're doing as a college from what I read and see from alumni and students than I ever do from what I personally observe that day in class. You really have no idea. <laughs> there's a mask that's there, and there's a, a behavior that's there if they're smart, right? And only the really uh, obstinate ones will challenge you to your face. So let's look at it that way, and uh, this is not an anti-social media session. It's really not. I'm, a, I'm actually a heavy social media user myself. I use it to try to promote the right things. I, try, I use it to try to engage in conversations with people that maybe I can have a connection with that are far outside of the physical realm in which I operate. And so it can be a great tool, and this isn't a negative session towards that, but let's just look at some of the danger areas. So I like this quote from John Adams, posterity, he said, you will never know how much it costs the present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you will make good use of it. If you do not, I shall repent in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. And I always wonder what our founders <laughs> would think. He's basically saying, I'll be rolling over in my grave if you guys misuse this. Here's our founders and the freedom of speech and the freedoms of association and religion that they fought so hard to preserve. 
in our Constitution. Notice, they didn't, they didn't fight so hard to create those freedoms. We understand those free, freedoms come to us from God. They are preserved in our Constitution. And our founders worked very hard to do that. And what have we done with them? You know, I love the quote about the Internet. It says, I have in my pocket a device with the power to know anything that has ever been discovered in human history. And I use it to look at videos of cats. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's, that sums up pretty much where we're at as a society with our smartphones and online. So let's look at this first issue of defamation. Defamation is essentially the law of hurt feelings, okay? You hurt my feelings. Have you noticed that we have a society that's a little bit thin-skinned? You know, whatever happened to the marketplace of ideas where we could go and combat each other verbally and have a good, robust argument about something that we disagree with? No, no. Now it's all trigger warnings and, you know, hurt feelings, right? It's this idea that I have a right not to be offended. And that's a real problem when you start clogging the courts with those kinds of cases. And yet that is exactly what we find in the area of defamation. It's basically, you hurt my feelings, you damaged my reputation, you said something negative about me. And the problem is, sometimes the truth hurts your reputation. Have you, <laughs> have you ever noticed that? That sometimes if you do something stupid and someone says, uh, you know, you just did such and such and that was pretty stupid. <gasps> You've defamed me. You've hurt my reputation. And you say, well, wait a minute. No, it was your conduct that hurt your reputation. In Europe, you realize they have fought for and secured the right to be forgotten. You know what that is? The right to be forgotten? Have you guys heard about this? Anybody tell me what that is? What is that? Give it to me in your words. The right to have all of your personal information deleted from the internet. And not just personal information, but any story about you even if it was true, if you want it to be removed, you can require news outlets, Google, websites, social media platforms to remove that so you can have a clean start. And we're going to talk in a little bit why that's even necessary. But this is the era in which we live, where people don't even want to be beholden to the truth. You notice that in our society, the truth is no longer the pillar of you know, of morality. It's no longer the ideal. The ideal is I ought to be able to construct a narrative of myself, an identity of myself that I decide and not that anyone else or even my own past actions should say for me. And that's extending into the online world and it's extending through different causes of action such as defamation. What is defamation? I take this slide directly from my business law class. Uh, de defamation is the publication of a false statement, oral or written, that injures a person's good reputation. If it's uh, oral, we call it slander. If it's libel, uh, if it's written, we call it libel. Which one do you suppose online communications are? Which one is that? Written. It's actually written. That's correct. Even though it only resides in magnetic information that is uh, stored and transmitted through electrical signals, the law says, if it happens online, it's written. The idea is, it is secured in a tangible and repeatable medium. That's the legal definition. <laughs> if it is, uh, if it is uh, able to be repeated, if it is recorded in some way, it's considered a writing, even if it's never written down by hand. And so, the problem is, with libel, it's easier to prove, because we have it right here, what you said. And so, can tweets be considered libel? Can a Facebook post or even a comment be considered defamation? Yes. Now, notice, it has to be false. We have at least, thankfully, preserved this particular element of the cause of action of defamation. So, you've heard it said, the truth is always a defense. Now you know what lawsuit they were talking about when they said that, okay? They were talking about a defamation defense. Opinions are protected. And so if you say, well, in my opinion, that's the ugliest person in the world, all right? Or, you know, Trump needs to step his game up on the insults, you know? <laughs> he needs to phrase that and say, well, that's my opinion. Or if it's obvious from the context that you're not speaking a, a, a fact, you're stating an opinion, you have that right. By the way, the truth 
defense and the opinion defense come to us not because that's the, the way the statutes are written, but because of the First Amendment. We have the right to tell the truth. We have the right to say our opinions. Now, there is a publication requirement. So you say, oh good, I'm not the New York Times, so I'm not publishing something, right? All that means is you repeated it in the presence of a third person. So if you go to someone very privately, I don't know you, but you have a, a tie on that has basketballs on it, so I'm assuming you're a coach or some kind or a, a fan of some kind. <laughs> All right. So if I was to go to Brother Scott here and say to him privately, what's your favorite basketball team? Indiana. Yeah, well, whichever. Indiana Hoosiers. The Hoosiers. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I hate the Hoosiers. All right. <laughs> in my opinion, the Hoosiers are the worst basketball team in the entire Big Ten, which has, ironically, like 16 teams in it. All right. <laughs> but uh, uh, I could say that. Now, I, I'm a Badgers fan, and you're a Hoosiers fan, and so we will, we will see eye to eye on almost nothing. I know that our worldviews are in complete conflict right now. But if I go to him privately, and say something that it, about him that's horribly negative, completely untrue, and that if any of you knew would completely destroy his reputation. But I only say it to him, not defamation. Why? There's no publication of that. But if, if one of you happens to be close enough to hear me say that to him and overhears it, now it's defamation because it's been published. That is all that's required. So. Even if the comment is made in the context of a group page for your school. How many of you know about a mom's group on Facebook for your school? I say know about because every single one of your schools has one. I just wonder if you knew about it or not, okay? Anything that's even said in the mom's group, which might even be called the mom's gossip group, just like honestly saying, putting it out there, um, those can be defamatory too. Do the moms know that? You know, when they talk about the teachers, when they talk about the school, when they talk about the policies, when they go on and on about things that maybe didn't even, when they talk about the classmates of their students, even in a closed group, that can be considered publication to meet this requirement for defamation. So we need to know that. We need to be very careful about what is said. So one of the things that people will often hide behind online is, they consider themselves to be protected because it was anonymous. Well, let me tell you, let me, I'll just show it to you here. This is how easy, this is the four steps. This is all it takes uh, to find out who you are. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna file the lawsuit and say I don't know who the person is. I'll just put John Doe as the defendant. That gets me into the system. I then can subpoena your records. I will send a subpoena to the ISP for the website. I will get the IP address, every communication, everything sent and received online has a unique identifier, and it's assigned by the ISP to a customer. So I will find out what the IP address is. Then I will simply amend my lawsuit to add the individual's name. Then I will go and sue for the attorney's fees. I'll demand settlement. It's easy as that. We know these steps because they're used by law firms, some reputable, some not so much, in uh, basically churning through litigation because they, they say basically this is like shooting fish in a barrel. They say finding violations on this and, and filing these lawsuits. And they, they're going for settlements in the area of two to $5,000. And what they're telling you is, listen, it's gonna cost you about that much to defend yourself. And so why don't you just settle this quietly and quickly with me, give me this check. You say, that's like extortion. Yeah, pretty much. It's legal extortion, okay? And, uh, and they say, you don't want to be dragged through this. You don't want all this put out in public. Now, ironically, their client's reputation would get completely trashed in, if you actually went forward with defending your lawsuit, but they don't care. They're counting on a quick settlement, and it's pretty easy to find out even an anonymous speaker online. Where these lawsuits were developed most of all is in torrenting or illegal downloading of, how should I say this, uh, illicit media that would be very embarrassing if people knew that this was being watched. And so some, some law firms figured out that they could embarrass people into settlements by finding out who they were, unmasking them basically, threatening them with public disgrace and lawsuits based on their true behavior but behind closed doors, and they would pay out big settlements for that. 
And so this has all been pioneered. It's all there just waiting to be used. The second one we look at, oh, by the way, let me ask, any questions about defamation before we move on and how this occurs? Text message sent from one student to another that is then forwarded to a third party, but not by the person that was forwarded. Well, that's a good question. So email or text messages or Snapchats or whatever else that's being sent and forwarded along, could that satisfy the publication requirement? Well, the interesting thing is the person who forwards it is the one that has published it. But the one that sent it originally, if they sent it directly to the person they're defaming, is that what you're saying, which is a kind of unlikely. We get more into bullying on that one, I think. Um, but the forwarding of it would be the publication. So if it was a third party, every person that forwarded it would be named in the lawsuit. I'm sure your students all understand that, though, when they, when they do it. OK. All right, so I, I found this great picture online, and I just uh, copied it off a of Google image search and put it on my thing because I thought there might be some ladies that came to the, to the thing, and you guys like that stuff. It says copy and paste, got the twins there. And I did that basically to illustrate a copyright violation, right? Because just because you can doesn't mean it's legal. It's incredibly easy to find images, videos, and things online but using them for professional, commercial, and sometimes even educational purposes is not necessarily legally allowed, all right? And it's really easy. <laughs> we have to use services at the college to make sure that the papers that are submitted really were written by the student that submits it, right? And they have these great services that go in and search online and find where they copied it from. And the defenses to this are amazing. You, you call them in and you say, dude, your entire paper is just one long site from, 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 another, uh, from five other sources, and you, you didn't cite a single one of them. You didn't put it in quotation. There, it doesn't appear to me that there's a single original thought in this entire paper. right?" And they say, what? I found it online. I thought that's what you wanted me to do. <laughs> there's no understanding whatsoever of intellectual property rights. Just because someone wrote an article and put it online or, or takes a photograph and puts it online doesn't mean it's available for you to use. The funniest case I ever had on this was a guy that wrote, a pastor that self-published a book on traditional biblical marriage. And so he found a great picture online for the cover of his book and it was of a married couple in the distance standing up on a hill, there's a path that goes up to the hill and they're embracing. Well, the photographer of that picture f saw it and was objecting to that particular uh, viewpoint on traditional marriage and pointed out the fact that although you couldn't, he didn't notice in the high-res version that the photographer has, that was a same-sex couple <laughs> in the photograph that he put on the cover of his traditional family values book, and he didn't even know. Now, he didn't have the rights to use that picture and obviously for other reasons, maybe had he known <laughs> what he was actually putting on there, might not have chosen that. But the fact of the matter is, just because you can, just because it's easy to copy and paste, doesn't make it legal. You notice those little copyright designations at the bottoms of articles and things like that. You need to contact them and ask for permission to use that. My experience is, Mainly authors and, and educators especially that put things online freely offer their permission. They just want you to preserve their copyright. And so you keep that on the bottom. You know, a lot of times people will take those and they, they kind of literally cut the copyright part off the bottom before they reproduce it and give it to the class. That's kind of a problem, all right? We have to preserve that. Uh, just because, quote, it's for education, and I heard there's an education exception for copyright, right? It's not 100%, <laughs> okay? There are caveats that, that uh, go along with that. You know, the choir director says, well, it's for education, so I'm just, you know, I bought one copy of the choir music, and I'm just photocopying it for everybody in the choir. No, that's a big problem, okay? You are the main audience for that choir music, and so that's how they make their money. Uh, but they won't sue a Christian school, or they won't sue a church. Oh yes, they will. Uh, and they will assign it to a law firm that would be more than happy uh, to sue a Christian ministry. Just because it's nonprofit, 
say, well, we're a nonprofit, we're a ministry, so we, we are exempt, right? It's not for commercial purposes. It's not your commercial purposes that they look at. It's the commercial purposes of the author who is selling this resource that you are copying. That's the commercial interest at stake. And so be very careful because the statute on this has major automatic damages that attach. And it's more than just, oh, well, if we get caught photocopying the choir music, then uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll pay for whatever number of copies we should have bought. That's not the level of damages. It's in the tens to the 50,000 plus dam uh, uh, level of damages when you get into a violation that's intentional like this. So you want to check the license before you use this. Now let me just go back with our topic of social media. If you are personally sharing some meme or some picture that you found online and you're sharing that as part of your uh, tweet or your Facebook post, that's not a problem because those kinds of things are individual and personal. It's when you get into your ministry account and what you are sharing there that I start to get more concerned, right? Now, the Trump campaign recently got uh, blasted because Donald Jr. posted the bowl of Skittles picture, right? Well, the, the question is, look, thousands of people have tw tweeted that picture, right? And somehow Skittles and the people who make Skittles never complained about their copyright then. But the minute it came into prominence because of the presidential campaign, now it's a big issue, right? I remember going back to the Romney campaign. And by the way, it's always the Republicans and the music people, uh, the bands, the rock bands that they use their, their walking out music, they always, they always complain, right? I've never seen a complaint about the Democrats. I don't know why that is. Uh, <laughs> but they say, hey, you can't use my song, right? You need the licensing for that. Well, hundreds and thousands of people have played those songs. What makes it so wrong in this context? Well, the thing that makes it wrong is that it's being used for a business or for a commercial, and that's different. That's a different level, right? And so we want to be careful about that when it is the ministry's own social media platform that we are retweeting or publishing those kinds of things. Look for the Creative Commons license. Creative Commons is a, a license that most ph photographs, for example, on Flickr and in a lot of different places where you'll find free images that you want to use, most of them do have the Creative Commons license. If that's the case, you can use it. But the license stipulates you have to give credit to the original photographer. You can't pass it off as your own or give no credit whatsoever. So giving a photo credit and then fine, it's free, that's okay. Go ahead and ask for permission. I remember when I was with CLA, I found a really great comic strip that I wanted to use in one of our seminar resources in the workbook. And I, kind of, I, was, a, I was nervous, you know, it was my first year out and I was writing this stuff and I thought, but this is really great. Yeah, I remember what it was. It was, uh, it was, we were doing a session on pastors and deacons and it said, the deacons really liked their new cowboy hats until the pastor came in with his. And it was all these deacons that had a white, big old white cowboy hats. And then the pastor walked in and he had a big old black cowboy hat. And they said, oh no, <laughs> you know, we've done something wrong. So I used that. And, and uh, instead of just putting it in the resources, I, I found the guy's name. I looked him up online and I emailed him. And he was so tickled that we wanted to use his comic strip. He, oh, that'd be great. And here's a bunch of other stuff I've done. And you might like this. And it's like, oh, I actually had a conversation with somebody that created something. This is kind of cool. And there was no problem at all. If you get permission, that's fine. And, or just buy the stock images. There are a lot of, of uh, websites out there. You get the high resolution version and uh, you can use that in your advertisements and in your things. If you're going to create something to promote the school, like a view book or something like that, and you need images, either use your own or buy them because it's a different level when you use it in promotional resources okay so I promise you when they put together can I borrow your book when they put together uh, well that's a picture of our own grads all right so that's the Maranatha example but I kind of doubt that you know the Great Lakes people actually were out there you know photographing this compass or this boat I promise you this is stock photo that they got permission to use either by getting permission or by purchasing uh, from one of those commercial websites. You guys are smiling. Is there anybody that actually knows who did this? I did. You, bingo. All right. We're good. Okay. <laughs> See, I knew you had your stuff together. All right. Good deal. All right. So you've noticed this little circle C, okay? 
what does it mean? How do you generate? How does a copyright come into existence? Do you have to have this? Well, there is such a thing as an automatic copyright. And the minute something is reduced to a tangible medium, that is written down, played in a recording or something, the copyright attaches immediately. You don't have to have the circle C, okay? What does the circle C do? It provides notice. That's it. It's just notice. And enhanced damages, which you don't ever want to find out about. And when the law says enhanced damages, <laughs> that's a bad sign, okay? Just put it that way. So when you see the circle C at the bottom, and then you see a year, and then you see a name, what does that mean? The year is the earliest date of publication or creation, all right? And so it's funny because one, one uh, boss I worked for uh, always wanted us to change the date to the newer date. I said, you don't understand. It's better to have the older date because it shows you did it first, <laughs> you know? So we compromised and we put both. We'd put like, you know, 1996-2003. So they'd know it was updated, I guess, is what he was going at. So it's not that this is old material. It's just that that was the first date of its original production, okay? Yes, sir? No. You can put that on anything you produce. Right. right put this on, it's called poor man's copyright. You don't have to file it with the government. You don't have to have it published. You can put it on something that comes out of your printer tomorrow. You know, you can put it on all your birthday cards, all your Christmas <laughs> cards. All right. You have a copyright in what you create. The funnest one, for the, is that a word? That's not a word. The most fun uh, for me is when the lawyers copyright their briefs that they submit to courts because they think other lawyers are going to think that was so great they're going to rip off the language. And then the lawyers start suing each other. That gets really <laughs> fun. Uh, it's like sharks in the water, you know, literally. Uh, so the circle C is, is notice. I recommend you put that onto your documents that you create, not that you took from someone else. Don't ever put a circle C of your own name on somebody else's thing. That's actually its own legal violation, okay? So that's what that means. It's notice, okay? And so you put that on there with the year and then the date, the entity. Now, I want to say one word about works for hire because this is an important concept in this context. The legal doctrine is that if you were hired to write something or if writing things is part of your job, so producing lesson plans and producing uh, an art. So if Maranatha comes to me and says, Matt, would you write an article for the upcoming Advantage magazine? Sure. I don't get the copyright ownership for that personally. The person who paid me to do that work by default gets the ownership of the copyright. So we had one of our profs recently was uh, approached and they said, we noticed you wrote an article in the Maranatha Seminary Journal and we'd like to publish that over in our publication, would that be okay? Well, they're asking the wrong guy. Because yes, he was the author, but he doesn't have the right to give you that permission, and they were gonna pay him to use our article, right? And even on our website it says, this is owned by the seminary, right? So I got involved, because the guy's a nice guy, and he asked me about it, and I said, oh, now listen, I don't mind him getting paid. And I told him, give him the money. He did the work. This is great. They're paying him more than we did to write the thing, okay? That's wonderful for him. But when you publish this thing, don't go putting his name on the copyright. You need to preserve that that was reprinted by permission. So when you're going to reprint something that already is copyrighted, just add that to the end if you've been given permission that you are reprinting by permission. That's a requirement to preserve the copyright as you recopy that, okay? So no problem there. When you get those photocopies and you can barely see the watermark that says do not copy, that's, the, that's, that's my, you know, the one that drives me the crazy the most. <laughs> when I'm going around uh, campus and I see one laying by a copier and I think, oh, come on, <laughs> please. And you'd like to think that we were better at that, but uh, we're not, not any better. All right, yes, sir. Right. Remember I said it's the default. It can be altered by contract. Most wedding photographers and others will say, you want reprints, you come back to me. You can negotiate usually and say, listen, for another X hundreds of dollars, I will give you the rights to the CD and for that. 
but they're very much protective of those rights as an artist or as a uh, photographer. Good, good question. Any other questions about copyright before we move on? Okay. Employment. Can you use what you find out online in hiring or firing or suspending or otherwise disciplining employees? There's a big movement right now to completely separate and isolate my professional conduct from my personal conduct. So I have what I do at work in my LinkedIn account, you know, we have for business where we have the tie picture and everything's prim and proper. And then there's my whatever, you know, my Twitter, my Facebook, whatever else people are using. Certainly Snapchat is a big one because people think it disappears. Let me help you. It doesn't disappear. <laughs> All right. Nothing disappears. We'll talk about that in a moment. So we find out something. Do you look at the social media? We have on our, on our checklist for new hires, the HR department does a social media search. Now, we're not requesting friends. We're not asking for passwords. OK, uh, but we are looking at at least the public profile of this individual. So if I go on there and I see that this person's standards do not reflect my ministry standards, can I pass on that individual? Well, the answer is yes, as long as you are looking at what they have intentionally put out there and what they have put online in their public profile, or if you are uh, already connected with them in some way. So at this point, the law is pretty much on the side of the employer. A bunch of cases, however, have been filed by rejected employees or disciplined employees that say this is lawful conduct. It's kind of interesting. Most states have a, a statute on the books. It's meant for smoking. But it says you cannot be disciplined or fired for engaging in lawful conduct, such as smoking. And that was the idea. Illinois has this. I used it in a case once uh, for a guy who was fired for blogging, uh, Christian Values blog, and he was fired from an insurance company. And when, when uh, a gay rights group brought it to the company and said, is this your guy? You need to let this guy go. So I used the lawful, pro the lawful conduct statute. He wasn't even a smoker. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and, and we, I don't know if that would have worked or not. We settled before it got that far, but I thought it was a good argument, right? Uh, and so employment, at this point is fair game. So with recruitment at this point, perfectly legal to use social media because of the fact that it's giving you another view. Now keep in mind, some people carefully curate their social media and other people are just like stream of consciousness. <laughs> you know, this is what I had for breakfast and here's where I'm going. And if they could live stream their life, they would. Um, and so just be careful because that can be so, sort of time consuming. But I highly recommend it. Posting uh, something online often makes it freely available for consideration in hiring, firing, or discipline. And so you can and should review that for recruitment. Employers very often turn to social media to filter out candidates. And uh, the problem is they may not always be very gracious about that. And we've noticed a few. Uh, there's a viral one that went out a couple years ago where this lady had gotten hired and then she went on her Twitter and she put on there that she couldn't believe she was even agreeing to go work for this awful company and she was going to hold her nose and just kind of bite her time and she knew that she was going to be leaving in like three weeks but she was going to do and she forgot that it was public and that the guy who just hired her was connected and saw the whole thing and said you know what Nancy or whatever don't bother coming in okay <laughs> that's okay we'll do you a favor and oops um, there's a story I've linked to here that is talking about a, a company that sent out and fired 5,000 employees by email, you know, and that's really not the personal touch people are looking for, uh, even if you have to give them bad news. And so we, we want to be gracious about how we use this and understanding. Understand, some of these kids have had social media their entire adult lives. And maybe before they started thinking about the fact that someday they might have to get a job. So maybe some of the really old pictures and things you're seeing uh, don't really reflect what they are and who they are now. Give them a little bit of credit. But uh, yes, you can use it for recruitment. What about employee discipline? I'll just put it to you this way because free speech, I have free speech. You can't discipline me. How many of you have ever heard something like that from a student or from an employee? Yeah. Let me give you a great line. 
It is not possible for you to violate someone's First Amendment rights. Do you know why? Because you are not the government. <laughs> All right? Now, if you were a bunch of public school educators sitting here, I would not be able to say that to you. This is a, the major difference and distinction between government-run schools and private Christian schools is that you are not state actors. And so it is not possible for you to violate their First Amendment rights. It's also not possible for you to violate their Fourth Amendment rights when it comes, does anybody know what that one is? Search and seizure, right? Okay, so when you have to go through the lockers or the cubby holes or the backpacks or whatever it is, uh, you can't violate their Fourth Amendment right. Now, there is such a thing as an invasion of privacy, so don't, don't go out of here saying that I told everybody you can turn their backpacks uh, upside down whenever you want. Uh, there's still some wisdom and procedure that ought to be in place there. But you're not the government. The First Amendment does not protect an employee from being monitored, disciplined, or terminated by a private employer for violating a clear and reasonable social media policy. But notice that last part. Do you have a clear and reasonable social media policy? And you know, you can't have Facebook is not a clear social media policy. So let's talk about what kinds of policies the schools should have. How many of you have some kind of guideline, whether it's written or verbal, with the teachers about what they should and should not post on social media, especially in regards to their classrooms? One, okay? Okay, we have work to do. Because here's the thing, uh, you have some parents in your school that will not appreciate pictures of their kids showing up on social media. I had a case in California where it was a custody dispute and the non-custodial parent was very dangerous, had threatened violence, and they had protective orders and they were essentially like in witness protection. And they were very clear to the school, don't let any pictures show up online on the website. or anywhere. He doesn't know where we are and if he finds out, we're in danger. You may have some of those in your school. You may have some, some people are just really almost irrational in their fear of the online world and their kids' pictures. They think somehow if you post a picture of their kid on Facebook, perverts are gonna come out of the woods and do bad things to their kids. This is that, you know, that's as sophisticated as they are in understanding how the online world works. But you have to respect that. You have to respect that. Best policy is that unless parents have opted in to allow you to use pictures of their kids, don't, don't. Backs of heads, unidentifiable scenes, and things like that are the better policy, okay? So really m makes people nervous when you've got a teacher that's snapping pictures in the classroom routinely and putting that stuff out on Facebook, okay? Be very careful about that. If you have a policy that says to teachers, you cannot post pictures from, by the way, the medical community is very much up to speed on this. Uh, we have a school of nursing. The, play, the hospitals and doctor's offices where our girls go or our students go uh, to do their uh, clinical rotations, they will not let them take smartphones or camera phones even into the facility with them. And I'm glad <laughs> because the temptation is constantly there. Oh, something cute happened or I had lunch or whatever it was and they want to take a picture. And we have to be very careful about that in the medical realm pretty much the same way now in education. So be very careful about that. I have a form that I suggest you put in your packet, which is a photo consent form. That will protect you, I like that. But it also has a caveat because every once in a while someone will say no. And that can be difficult to manage when you're taking a picture of all the kids at recess <laughs> and you have to like go through and black out that kid, you know, that one face or censor it off or blur it or whatever. You will forget or somebody won't notice. And you've sort of taken on yourself that responsibility, haven't you, when you accepted and said, okay, we won't post about your kid. So that's why I'm saying we need to think this through maybe a little bit more in terms of social media. And that goes for them personally, and it for sure goes for any official pages that you have as a school. It's a great outreach, and it's a great connection, but we have to be careful about that. Uh, employees do not have an, uh, a constitutional right to privacy in the workplace. Uh, there are certainly some laws that protect certain types of social media speech. Some laws have 
Some states have laws that protect negative reviews and comments that are made about businesses and things like that. Uh, but that's a very, very limited area. Okay? All right. Any questions about that in terms of employee discipline? Yes, sir. I couldn't find you online. You're, I don't want to hire you. Uh, the answer is that's not a protected class, and so it's not a protected thing. And I guess if the employer is that irrational and wants to make that their hiring standard, then I would say probably so, yeah. Right. And, you know, all this stuff, prosecutors stood up, handed the judge photos from their Facebook page. Oh, yeah. Just the weekend before, and her drinking yeah. and carousing and everything. Else. Listen, how many cases, uh, workers' comp claims, oh, I'm so injured, and by the time he gets into court, he looks like he's crippled for life, and then they've got videos of the guy, you know, playing racquetball and doing all kinds of other things. And he posted them himself. It used to be you had to hire a private investigator. <laughs> now people do the work themselves. <laughs> These are three simple rules I want you to teach your students, okay? I want you to teach the, them these three simple rules, okay? Number one, your audience is bigger than you think. Your audience is bigger than you think. The IRS has internet access. The FBI has internet access. All the three-letter government organizations have it. So the government is watching. Uh, your ideological enemies are watching what you have on your website and your social media. The community is watching. Your politicians are watching. Uh, prospective parents and, and uh, members are looking at the website. Now, long before they ever come and visit your church or school, they've checked you out online. And not just your website, but they're looking at what people have said on Google Maps, reviews, and everywhere else, okay? So your audience is much bigger than you think. No one is anonymous. That's rule number two. No one is anonymous. I showed you how easy it is in litigation to find out, but they can do it even more quickly with the technology. No one is anonymous. They can find you. They can find that print, that footprint. Yes. Um, can they, do they get around the uh, there's like privacy browsers and things like that? Tor. Right. Um, there are certainly more sophisticated encryption methods that are available. I might argue that that in and of itself, the use of that is in and of itself a little bit incriminating, but uh, now there's an Opera browser that has a VPN built in. Sure, oh, so great, I've been able to circumvent the system. The problem is they're too smart for their own good. And what I have found is that uh, the, the criminal mind is only so it goes so far. My criminal procedure professor used to talk about the average mentality of a criminal, you know, <laughs> and how the, 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 the type of person who decides that this risky life of crime is the way I should definitely go rather than getting a regular job is usually not brilliant enough to actually pull it off in the long term, right? And so uh, I would say the same thing. It's kind of interesting on campus. We have a very robust filter that is there as a guideline. It's kind of like a fence on the Grand Canyon. It's there to remind an innocent person that it doesn't stumble over the edge. Are there ways around it? I'm sure there are. Most of them are walking around with a way in their pocket. They don't even need it, right? And yet, every semester, every week, another one gets tripped up. And all that does is it gives us an opportunity to minister. It gives us an opportunity to say, okay, look, we got a problem here, right? And there, let's don't forget, there is a spiritual dynamic to this as well. And, and be sure your sin will find you out is still in the Bible, all right? Even with the <laughs> online. So no one is anonymous. And then finally, number three, online content lasts forever. It's only lost to you when you were wanting to turn it in or you have that presentation the next day, right? Everyone else can eventually still go in and get it. I had a, a case one time where a pastor had been um, caught up in some really nasty stuff and had actually been raided by the police in a, in a raid of, based on online activity. And when he heard that they were coming in the building, he pulled out a gun and shot his computer. <laughs> you talk about a little bit of evidence of guilt, right? But he shot his computer right through the hard drive. D 
did not slow them down one bit. They pulled the platters off, they went down. They, they can get it down to the forensic, uh, the, the, the molecular level. Um, deleting something on a hard drive is like taking the numbers off of your street address on your house. You didn't delete your house, all right? It's still there. You just took the numbers off. You made it a little harder to find, a little harder to find. I need one more step, like look next door, look next door, and that's the one, okay? It's not that hard to find deleted stuff on the computer. Even writing over it doesn't get it at that level. So we need to teach young people that. How many young ladies have been caught up in this with the sexting and the, and, and, and the issues of what's been said, thinking it was private, thinking it was Snapchat and it was disappearing? It doesn't disappear. Snapchat doesn't disappear. It's two clicks and I've preserved a screenshot. And how many celebrities figure that out too late, right? And so we need to teach them these principles so that they can understand and be careful online. So what are the three? Your audience is bigger than you think. No one is anonymous and online content lives forever. Thank you.